Baker, who is a sought after period coach and author of 50 Things You Need to Know About Periods. For nearly a decade, Claire has taught thousands of women how to live in harmony with their menstrual cycle rather than working against it. Claire believes menstrual cycle awareness is the missing key in women's well-being, empowerment and creativity and her immersive online courses and workshops inspire women to know their flow and become the authority in their own lives. Claire's online program Adore Your Cycle has students in over 35 countries. With a background in visual arts and creative business, Claire is a certified health and life coach, has studied menstrual leadership, and is trained as a natural fertility teacher. Known for her authentic voice and ability to make periods fun, Claire is regularly featured in publications such as Red, Glamour, and Women's Health magazine. Originally from Australia, Claire now lives in sunny East London and spends her days coaching, teaching, writing, dancing, and being as close to trees as she possibly can. Claire, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Oh, Ali, it's a joy. I'm so happy to be here. Thanks for having me. Thank you. You're welcome. I would love you to tell us a bit about your journey and how you became a period coach. Best job in the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, best job and like kind of weirdest job, you know, it still feels um, in my little menstrual bubble and, you know, in the coaching bubble, it doesn't feel that strange to be talking about periods, but I have to admit when I am meeting somebody, um, new in my life who has no concept of tracking your periods or understanding you know the different phases of the cycle they are always a bit shocked um and a bit like speechless as to when i <laughs> when i introduce myself and what i do so yeah i came to this work um through my own personal struggles with my hormones as I think a lot of people do particularly healers and coaches and teachers and um, you know those of us who are wanting to serve other people often it does come because we've had our own hurdles and darknesses and shadows challenges and for me it started this journey started for me when I came off the contraceptive pill and I was 26 so I've been on it for about a decade and when I came off the pill I was waiting and waiting for my period to come back and it just didn't, it just didn't return. So I stopped taking the pill and then just nothing happened for an entire year. I didn't bleed. And so I had this year of like wondering what had happened to my period and why it didn't, you know, why it didn't return. And I, and to be honest with you, Ali, I got a bit, um, a bit worried and a bit concerned. I thought that maybe I had permanently, damaged my reproductive system or something by having been on hormonal contraception for so long. So I did a lot of research and I can say, I can say that I didn't, I didn't damage it. It's fine. Um, but I did a lot, yeah, a lot of research and a lot of learning, a lot of lectures, books, workshops, just trying to understand the menstrual cycle and trying to understand what on earth it was I was even waiting for to come back. So like I knew that I was waiting for my period to come back, but I didn't really understand the process of the menstrual cycle. I didn't really understand what ovulation was and, and the, you know, the mechanics of how it all worked and what I needed to do to take care of my body so that it could all come back. So I, I really just dove into that. At the same time, I was already coaching women. So I was working as a health and life coach and working with women on all sorts of things from diet to fitness to self-doubt to career to relationships creativity and it became really apparent to me learning more about the menstrual cycle and ultimately when my period did come back and I was learning more about my own cycle that it was impossible to talk about women's health and personal development and creativity and all of these areas that I was coaching people on without looking through the lens of the menstrual cycle, because I realized quite quickly that um, mood, confidence, libido, energy levels, sleep, cravings, memory function, so many things were affecting, were affected by the menstrual cycle. I noticed through my own personal experience, I observed it in my clients, and the more I read and understood about the um, female hormonal cycle and the ebb and flow of the, the fluctuations, I realized that these there were these four distinct hormonal phases and that, yeah, all of these different parts of our lives and all of these different parts of ourselves were affected by the shift in hormones. And so it just became, a it became, I guess, one focus of my work. And then over years and years, it's now become like the core focus of my work is helping people who have periods understand that 
it, this is so much more than just periods, you know, understanding the entirety of the menstrual cycle and understanding all of these different phases and understanding how you change within those phases is just essential self-knowledge in my opinion and really life-changing information because I think you know, as women, we're very used to pushing against our bodies and feeling frustrated with the ebb and flow of energy. But actually, if we can understand what's going on and we can work more in harmony with it, then it really does change, change, changes so much. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. uh, that literally is my next question. I would love to know more about our cycle that you're talking about and these different elements that you're talking about. Can you give us like a mini menstrual cycle lesson? <laughs> Yeah, of course. So, okay, so we have these four different hormonal phases and your period is just one of those phases. I think that's one of the most common misconceptions that I hear from people is this, um, I guess, confusion that your menstrual cycle and your period are the same thing or that you've just got this one week of bleeding and then the rest of the time is just kind of the same, um, which really couldn't be further from the truth. If you have a natural menstrual, menstrual cycle, you'll have that one week, maybe one, two, three days, five days, whatever the length of your period is, that's going to be one phase of your cycle. And that's what I call the winter phase of your menstrual cycle. So we can use the seasons of the year as an, a really lovely analogy to help to understand the process that we move through every month. So that's the winter of the menstrual cycle. It's when we're bleeding on our period, that's menstruation. And like the season of the year, it's natural to probably feel like you want to just kind of stay at home, wrap yourself up in a blanket and chill. Energy levels won't be super high. Um, hormone levels are at their lowest for the entire cycle. And then we move into spring. And just like the season of the year, this is often you know, a time where a lot of people experience a burst of energy. There's a sense of wanting to come back out into the world. There's like a, a momentum, this, this wave of energy that rises in the body as estrogen rises in the body. So we're building up to ovulation here. And this is a, a transition season in the sense that it's, it's waxing. We're coming out of the period cave and coming out of menstruation right up into spring we're heading towards summer and summer is ovulation so this is the other what I call the other pole in the cycle so we've got menstruation and we've got ovulation and we're either at one of those two points or we're moving we're moving between them you know, we're always somewhere on this cycle so the summer phase is yeah it's like the summer of the season it's very much about um, sharing connecting with others, networking. It's the fertile phase in the menstrual cycle. So naturally, you know, our, our patience is quite high, our resilience, our confidence, our turn on, like we often feel like superwoman in this phase of the menstrual cycle and hormones are at their highest levels. So it's natural to have more energy here and to feel stronger um, and, to, and to feel more extroverted and to really want to be with people and connect. After summer, we then move into the final week of the menstrual cycle, which is um, the autumn phase. And this, in this phase here, we see a shift, quite a significant shift in hormones. So we've gone from having this lovely, like, linear increase and in peak of the hormone estrogen. And now the hormone progesterone comes in. And this hormone is much more interested in keeping us safe, keeping us you know, well rested, it's very soothing hormone, it makes us more sleepy and it's less interested in us like being out in the world and being with people and it's much more attuned to, you know, saying no, taking care of ourselves, setting boundaries and, and turning within in preparation um, for our next period. So once we've moved through autumn and then that, that premenstrual week, which I, I need to say that I understand that that week doesn't always feel like a lovely soothing time for a lot of people. It can actually manifest in premenstrual symptoms. You know, maybe we can talk more about that too. But um, yeah, it's, it's, it can be a tricky and tender phase in the menstrual cycle, but also you know, a very powerful time. Again, when we have that awareness and we understand what's going on and we don't expect ourselves to, to maintain that superwoman energy that we had in our summer phase, if we understand that there's been this hormonal shift and we can actually turn inwards and take better care of ourselves and just slow down a little bit, often some of those premenstrual symptoms um, can subside. And then we move into the winter phase again and we begin to bleed and release the past cycle and one cycle ends and the next one 
begins and we move through that process um, in our menstruating years, monthly-ish, and just continue on, on that cycle. So at some point, if you're somebody who is currently you know, in your menstruating years, you'll be somewhere on that menstrual cycle on any day. And I just feel like the period cave is so relatable. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like you just do just want to be huddled up someone bring me a hot chocolate no one talk to me it's true how do you like how do you spend your winter phase oh okay. I honestly I actually really enjoy my winter phase I'm a big person for blankets hot chocolate movies cuddles in mm-hmm. fact I'm on day four at the moment so I'm just peeking out of it so I'm a sucker for Disney plus at the moment in the winter yeah. phase so good thing. um but again you talk about the pms i would like to touch upon that because it is that week just before your period it is for some women it's just awful like it's just they get the worst sort of symptoms for it and i wonder if you could tell us maybe ways that women could kind of turn that week from being something that women honestly just dread to going actually this is quite nice i actually quite like this yeah, of course. Look, my, yeah, look, my heart really goes out to anybody who does experience um, from mild to severe premenstrual symptoms because it can be incredibly disorientating, debilitating. Like, you know, it can just be simply annoying, but for some women, it can also really affect the quality of, of their life. So I think the first thing with, with any part of this work is, is awareness. And this is where charting your cycle is just so important so that you know where you are in the menstrual cycle. So to give you an example, I'm on cycle day 18 today. So I'm kind of opposite you. You're also <laughs> coming out, like starting to come out of your winter phase and I'm moving out of my summer and heading more into the, to the darker half of the cycle. <laughs> and, um, and I woke up this morning and I had scheduled a workout um, this morning and I woke up and I just did not feel like it. I put my exercise gear on and I like literally came out to the to the room here and I, I laid out my yoga mat and got my kettlebell and I was just like, nope, it's just not there today. I feel, you know, it's, I've had so much energy for the past week and I had like loads of energy in my body. I've been working out and feeling really great. And then today I could feel, I can feel that change. I can feel that that increase in progesterone and actually, you know, and I slept longer last night as well now that I think about it. And and so I just turned some music on and for 45 minutes, I just like, I don't know what you even call it. It was like a yoga dance thing where I just like, <laughs> Move my body. Amazing. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, yeah. I'm just like, I'm just gonna like stretch, get into those bits that I need to get into. I'm just, you know, gonna shake it, like lots of shaking, and just like getting, you know, getting into my body, but not pushing it to um, to maintain the same level of like energy that I and strength that I have had for the past week, mm-hmm. and. And even that kind, like that kind of awareness of recognizing, okay, cool, this is where I am in my cycle today. I didn't feel like doing that um, that more intense workout, so I chose to do something different instead. So there's a self kindness piece here as well, where we just we have to accept that like we're not linear, we're not the same every single day, and recognize, right, this is where I am today. I'm not going to give myself a hard time because I had planned to do a you know kettlebell workout, and instead I just kind of like rolled around and stretched my body and like shook and danced. Um, that's okay. So it's also this concept of, of cycle thinking that I often talk about is like just approaching each day, maybe that little bit differently to how you had, had done a week ago. And that can make an enormous difference in that premenstrual week is just recognizing that the way that you approach your diet, the way that you approach your fitness regime, the way you approach your relationships, maybe you might need more time alone, more space. Maybe you do change the way that you work out. Maybe you change the way that you work. There might be you know, really subtle differences. And I'm not saying that you need to overhaul your life, But even just that, like that example I just gave, like a small tweak this morning meant that I didn't like use up all of my energy. I actually gave my body what it really needed. And I set the tone for my day by coming into a bit of a slower space. So I'm still doing all of the things on my schedule today that I had planned and I still, I still moved my body, right? But the energy and the attitude with which I'm holding myself is, is just a little bit different now because I made the decision at the beginning of the day to take a bit more of a softer approach. So that can really help a lot with 
I, you know, and it, it might sound really simple, but it can help really help to alleviate some of that premenstrual frustration and, um, yeah, and rage and self-criticism because this is the phase in the cycle, right, where that like inner critic just takes over the, the microphone and is so loud and so cruel and so unhelpful that the more we can just practice self-kindness in this phase and checking in to see where we're going, see how we're feeling, see where we're going, see what we need today, even that would just make such an enormous difference. And sure, we could talk more about foods and lifestyle choices and hormonal imbalances and all of those things that also contribute to premenstrual symptoms. And I do encourage people to investigate those. Um, but I really do believe that this awareness and this kindness and like just softly, gently tweaking the way we live in, in that week can make an enormous difference. Does that make sense? 100%. And it is, I think the one thing that you said that's really resonated is that individual like every day is going to be different for you and like you said this morning it was like nah I'm not doing this workout I've got to do something else and it is about bringing kindness to the day and going you know what I'm not a 24-hour robot I am every day a different person and I'm going to have different energy that I need to work with to make the best for me and I agree there's so much stress and pressure that we put on ourselves with that kind of that self-talk in our head that can really actually affect us in a negative way if we continue to let it and add to that stress and another question I had for you regarding that is how do you feel our menstrual cycle impacts our mental health because obviously when you're in that PMS state and you've got that negative self-talk that's going to be putting a lot of pressure for someone who may have anxiety or PTSD like that's going to be really exaggerating those symptoms and things so yeah I wondered how you feel or felt that the menstrual cycle does impact your mental health mm such a good question it's such a good question it's a question that i wish more people would ask and i wish that our um medical and mental health systems would ask and i wish that there were was more research in this area you know i wish that i could kind of point you easily in the direction of a really clear study that um that demonstrated the relationship between mental health and menstrual cycle awareness um unfortunately there isn't a great deal but yeah, of course, our menstrual cycle and the different phases of the menstrual cycle are going to affect um, the quality of our mental health, definitely. And it's something that I encourage people to, to check in with every day when you're doing a cycle check-in, like, sure, how are your energy levels and your physical symptoms, but what's going on for you mentally? What are the, you know, what are the thoughts that you're having? What's the quantity of those thoughts? You know, are, are you noticing there's a lot of busyness and anxiety? Are you feeling maybe more depressed and down? Like what's going on for you mentally? And what I've noticed is that over a number of cycles, patterns will start to emerge for women and they will start to see that there are actually moments in the cycle where their mental health um, is more sensitive and they might be more vulnerable to experiencing feelings of depression or anxiety and again that aw that awareness is just so powerful right because then you know you know and you can prepare in advance by maybe not over scheduling yourself on that day or maybe upping your the mental health self-care that you know really works for you around that time reaching out for support and for help and and if you are seeing a, um, a mental health professional integrating that awareness into into your sessions and into um, you know any medications or any like other herbal supplements that you're taking like understanding these vulnerable moments and integrating that into any mental health plan, I think is just so important. And yes, I often do see that that autumn week, that premenstrual week can be a really um, intense time for people. One thing we do know is that there is a relationship between um, historical trauma and premenstrual dysphoric disorder, PMDD, which is like a you know a very severe form of of, PM, of PMS, of premenstrual symptoms. And so we do know there is a relationship. If somebody's experienced trauma in their lives, then that can they are more likely to also experience PMDD. That's kind of as far as that information goes, though. There's still so much more research that needs to be done, um, and I look forward to that happening. Um, but if you are somebody and you know that that premenstrual week is tough for you, then like use that information to really manage your mental health around that time, particularly in those couple of days just before your period starts. So they, they can be particularly, particularly sensitive time. Yeah, beautiful. And 
I completely agree with you. I don't think there's enough research into this and I don't think enough time has been put into it because I also believe they are just completely interlinked after I've been tracking my cycle for, oh gosh, three years now. And it has been a massive game changer for my mental health and my symptoms of anxiety and PTSD. Like you just pick up things and you know your vulnerable points so much better. So yes, I'm keeping my fingers crossed with you that they will do more research into it because it's so important. Um, and so I've talked about tracking as well. You keep talking about tracking your cycle and things. And I wanted to ask, I know that some women don't menstruate and there are some women, like you said, when you didn't have your period and they don't necessarily have a point to go, where's my period started then? Where's my menstrual cycle started? So I wondered what can those women do so they still have a cycle or they can still follow a type of menstrual cycle that works for them? Mm -hmm. Of course, definitely. So when I talk about tracking your cycle, I'm talking about you know following those days of your menstrual cycle. And so day one of your cycle is the first day of your period, and then you know then you follow from that. So if you do have a menstrual cycle, that's how to track day one, first day of that full blood flow, and then count forward from there. So if you're trying to figure out where you are today, then just look back to your last period, figure out what um, what that day one was. And then count forward from there, and that's where you are. And there are definitely moments in, um, you know, if you if you are somebody who menstruates, there will be moments in your life that you may not have a menstrual cycle. At some point, we're all going to stop menstruating um, as we get into perimenopause and menopause and beyond. For women who um, become pregnant in their lifetime, or breastfeeding, postpartum, as I said, I experienced pill amenorrhea, which was not bleeding for that year after coming off the pill. Certain medications can um, can cease menstruation. So stress, you know, is a huge one. Um, yeah, so there's there's definitely the possibility that at some point in your life you will experience a period of actually not menstruating, and. I like to borrow the lunar cycle in these situations when I'm working with a client who currently is administrating. If somebody still wants to chart, some people, it won't matter. They'll be like, cool, let's find out another period. I'm not bothered. But if somebody does want to like maintain this, really it's a mindfulness practice, isn't it, of charting and checking in with themselves and seeing how they're feeling, we can borrow the lunar phases, the lunar cycle, because it mirrors the 28th or 29-day menstrual cycle. And it's the same like, death and rebirth cycle that I spoke about in terms of the seasons. If we think about the way the, the seasons of the year wax and wane, the menstrual cycle waxes and wanes, and so does the moon. So the new moon we can consider to be... Um, menstruation like the winter phase and the full moon is a copulation like the summer and then the spring phase is is that um, the weeks where we're waxing and transitioning and the moon is growing bigger and then as the moon grows is smaller and becomes darker that's like the autumn week of the menstrual cycle and there is actually an app that you can download called the moon which shows the day that the moon is on. And so you can literally just check the app or go outside and have a look at the moon at night and see where the moon is. And that's what I did in the year that I was waiting for my period to return. I started to borrow the lunar cycle so I could start practicing charting and checking in before my period returned. And I do hear it a lot from, from clients and students that when they become pregnant or when their period does stop for whatever reason that they do, they do miss it and that they do miss that that holding of the, the rhythm of the menstrual cycle. So that's one way that um, that you can still check in. Beautiful. And I love that using, you know, nature and the natural world. It's always there for you. And it's never going to stop. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And we're always moving through that lunar cycle. So at any time you can, you can lean in and jump in and just check in to see where the moon is. And for people who are menstruating, um, that can be something to check in as well is to start to pay attention to the moon and see, you know, how your cycle sits with the lunar cycle. I'm not super, um, I don't, so I certainly don't encourage people to try to sync their cycle with the moon, but it can be interesting to observe where the moon is and observe where you are in your own cycle and just to pay more attention to the cycles around us. I think that helps with accepting our own, our own rhythm is by acknowledging the other cycles, that the other natural cycles that we just very happily and easily live in. You know, we're very used to 24 hour cycle for example like nobody questions the need for sleep we understand that like when we wake up in the morning at like you know 7 a.m and how we feel at 4 p.m they're going to be different 
and we understand that there is this waxing and waning of the day you know we've literally structured our entire lives around around it i think this work this menstrual cycle awareness work is just understanding that there's another clock that we have and it's it's the monthly one and you know then there's it's a different way of operating but that it's just another cycle 100 percent, and it is i couldn't agree with you more there is the kind of the 24 hour hustle isn't there in life of like you've only got 24 hours like you know Beyonce has 24 hours so do you what are you gonna do and it's like Beyonce <laughs> also has 28 days like just breathe everyone we have time but yeah it's a whole other cycle and like you said you know there's so much to utilize with it that hasn't been researched yet and the effects that it can have and I feel that I've had friends that have actually used the moon when they haven't had their period and actually that has been or their menstrual cycle sorry and that's actually been really men, men, sorry beneficial for their mental health as well because they actually have something that they can still reflect inwards with they have a tool to use which has been really really helpful yeah i think that's a great point to mention is that the menstrual cycle does offer this opportunity for introspection and reflection and pause and rest and so by you know by borrowing the lunar cycle if you're not currently menstruating you can still give yourself that opportunity to take that time out when you need it and to to be like the moon you know if the moon is dark in the sky and you can't see it then take that opportunity to also go within and to reflect and to set those intentions and just pause for a moment otherwise we're we're just at 100, 100% all of the time. And ultimately, that's how a lot of us, you know, have operated for most of our lives. And that leads to burnout. You know, we know that. We know that we, we're not machines. You know, as you said earlier, we can't just be on all of the time. Um, and I think we've all tried that at certain points. I definitely have. And it just doesn't work, right? <laughs> You're like, guilty. <laughs> 100%. And then talking about the kind of the burnout of things and when perhaps we have gone too far into kind of pushing ourselves with our body or in one part of the seasons that you talked about, what are some of the major red flags that women need to kind of be aware of when it comes to their menstrual cycle that could actually be an indication of something more serious like a hormonal imbalance, PCOS, endometriosis? And when is that point that they should be going to a GP or to seek further advice from a health practitioner? Yeah, really great question and an important one. Um, if you notice in really any any significant change, chart it and pay attention to it. If you notice, for example, that your premenstrual symptoms have significantly increased and you are finding it difficult to go about your day because of, of the, um, the mental health, say, or the emotional health, or even the physical symptoms, that's definitely time to call in some support. If you're tracking, um, you know, the quantity of your blood and you notice that you're bleeding quite a bit more, um, anything more than 80 mils is considered heavy menstrual bleeding and that should definitely be, you know, you have a chat to your GP about that. Period pain, if you have pain that stops you, again, from, from living and working, um, you know, in a normal, regular way, then certainly that needs to be checked out because um, that could definitely be indicating something else going on. If you notice really long cycles, so you know anything over 35 days is something to consider that maybe um, it might be a stress pattern cycle that's delaying ovulation, could be PCOS. There are other reasons why ovulation might be delayed. But just, again, like having that awareness that, Lots of people do experience stress pattern cycles from time to time, but if it's an ongoing thing and you're noticing, you know, an ongoing pattern of these of these lengthier cycles, or a change in the length of your cycle of more than seven days, so say you have a 25 day cycle, but then you have like a 45 day cycle, then that's definitely something to get to get looked at as well. Okay, awesome. Thank you, because I think that's again something that you know we were never really taught in school you know when it came to kind of period education it it wasn't talked to us about you know the signs and symptoms actually what the period was so I think that's really important that women are aware that if they are having horrific pains at their period and they cannot get to work that's not a normal thing yeah no it's not and I think that that's a misunderstanding too you know a huge misconception is that your period is this really awful 
burden where you, it's normal to experience a lot of pain and to feel awful. Um, but that's actually not the truth. You know, the female body isn't designed to suffer. Um, it's it's likely a, you know, a sign that there's something else that's going on. And, um, and this is, again, the magic of menstrual cycle awareness is that you just start to understand what's normal for you. And then if there is any variance from that, then you know it's probably time to to chat to somebody who can support you with figuring out what that is absolutely and talking about kind of period education I would love to know a little bit about your education that you had on your period and your first period experience because I don't think it's really talked about us women talking about the first time we had our period and we'll often talk about the first time we had sex and everybody has a different experience but it's not a common discussion to have about the first time we had our period and maybe how traumatic it was or how easy it was Mm -hmm. such a good question you're so right it's not something that we often talk about and it's really important to go back and reflect on that because you know in the personal development game we understand that the beliefs that we formed in our early years do shape who we are right and so we're often going back and reflecting on our childhood years and our teens and where we absorb different things and where that conditioning came from and in the same is true for menstruation you know what were i think it's a great question to ask like, what were those early years like when did you first learn about menstruation what did you learn what was your first period like who did you tell um what language did you use with, with girlfriends so I actually don't remember my first period at all. Um, I remember like time around it. So I remember the anticipation. I remember wanting to get it and like checking, you know, my undies to see if there was any blood and like friends of mine had started. So I think I was almost 15 when mine started. So I was a little bit later than some of my girlfriends. And I, and I really remember like it wanting to come my mum's a nurse and she's the kind of person who just you know is so open about everything as a kid like I was the I was the kid in new one who knew the difference between a vagina and a vulva and who could explain to people like what testes were like I was just that kid that had all of the language I completely understood what was happening you know the body and the names of things and all of that I knew what mum's tampons were like she had them out in a tin on the toilet and I'd seen her pads with blood on them and things like that like I, I definitely grew up in a very um open household it was amazing often a naked household like my parents were just really chill and I'm one of four um daughters so we you know when we were all at a stage in our lives when we were all menstruating like my dad would just really happily take out our like pad bin and like empty it and there was no qualms he was just yeah. like whatever it's cool um so I definitely didn't have like I, I, and I can't quite figure out I've, I've tried to go back and figure out like wait why have I why, why is this memory just not there and I know that I didn't tell my mum. I know that I specifically didn't tell her. I think in a way I was sort of like rebelling against how open she was. I'm quite a private person by nature and 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 she's not. And I think that I at that like 15 year old me was just like, you know what, I'm just gonna, I'm not gonna tell you because you know you're, I'm gonna rebel against you and like I'm just gonna do it by myself. Um which makes me a bit sad, but it is, you know, also like kind of amusing that it was like my like retaliation to all of her openness was actually to not tell her. So I didn't receive any menstrual education in like in the moment that I started bleeding to the point where I had no idea what I was doing. I do remember trying to flush a menstrual pad down the toilet because I just had no idea that you weren't meant to do that. I do remember um, attempting a triathlon with a tampon like literally hanging out of my vagina because I didn't know that you were meant to push it all the way up Amazing. you know so, yeah like I have these memories of me just like fumbling around like not really knowing what I was doing because I was too stubborn to ask for help and for anyone to actually help me um, so yeah I've kind of got a yeah, it's, it's funny and it's important to go back and have a laugh about it all, you know, and it would have been brilliant if there was more understanding of the entire menstrual cycle. I think that's what I really grieve for myself is like, I figured out how to use a tampon. That was fine. But I would have loved to have received some education at that age about things like the premenstrual week and about that shift in hormones because, you know, we often talk about teenagers being really angsty and, and like, you know, cranky and 
I just wonder, and I was, and I wonder if maybe if I had understood that maybe that was just my premenstrual week, you know, maybe that was, you know, premenstrual moods. And if I had understood that that's where I was in my cycle, how might that have impacted my relationships or my, my studies and how I felt about myself, my self-esteem, all of those things, my body image. Um, I would have loved, that's what I would love to go back and give to my like 15 year old self would be an understanding of the whole menstrual cycle, as well as maybe a bit of a tutorial on how to insert the period. At a tempo. 100%. And this is so weird because one of my actual questions later on was what advice would you give your 15 year old self? Well, there you go. Yeah. yeah Thank you so much for sharing that story. I love those stories. <laughs> I just, I, I just love hearing them because it's so true. Like, everybody has a different experience and you know like you said you have no recollection of yours and I remember mine I was 10 and we hadn't had any education and I honestly thought I was dying and I went to my teacher and told her that she had to call my mum because I was dying and then she went she sort of had this smile on her face and was like okay she was like we're gonna go to the staff toilets now and I was thinking they take kids to the staff toilets to die I was like this is a really weird school like I was like they're not even calling my mum and then she brought out this like folded thing and I was like what is that like is that to, is that to stop me till I get to the hospital like what's going on and it was just traumatizing and my mum had given me the book you know because she knew it was happening um and I just shoved it under the bed and as much as she tried to have a conversation with me I was like I don't want to know like I'm, I'm so little and it was like looking back hilarious now to think that my teacher had taken me to the toilet because I was dying but you know it, we all have different experiences with it you know yours again completely different and five years apart mm -hmm. yeah five years apart yeah it's a big difference at that age to a 10 year old to a 15 year old it's a significant difference in age a very different experience mm -hmm. and I think you know one of the things that I'm very passionate about is having like you said that education in school because you know we're not taught about the menstrual cycle like you said it would have been so good to know that you know actually maybe it's not the teenagers are being angsty maybe actually it's something to do with their hormones and again we're not having the education in primary school so you know there are these poor children that are having periods and I have no idea what's going on with their body and are already having a menstrual cycle without understanding what's mm. going on mm, yeah I, I hope it's changing I think it is there's definitely more conversation around menstruation and menstrual products you know accessing those in schools um, I would just like to see it move towards understanding the entirety of the menstrual cycle and to understand how our hormones affect us and how and how they can really impact on our, on our mental health, physical health, everything. Not just how a pad works. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. which is really important, but there's a bigger picture here. <laughs> 100%. And actually talking of period talk, I wanted to ask you about your new book, 50 Things You Need About Your Period, because there is a part in it about communication around periods and how to communicate with friends, partners, about maybe how you're feeling in your cycle or about your period, because, you know, we're aware that there's still this kind of stigma around periods of like, sometimes it's the private conversation you have behind doors. And we all know we have that family member that you say the word period and they run out of the room. And I wondered if you could discuss about kind of breaking that stigma and what you would suggest about communicating with friends or family or your partner about your period and your menstrual cycle and the needs that you have yeah it's so important it's important to normalize it and to just you know to be able to just speak really openly and naturally about your menstrual cycle I'm not saying that you need to go and you know shout it from the rooftops when you start bleeding if you, if, you know if you want to great that's fine but to just at least be able to speak like openly with the people in your life about it, um, I think is a really great start. So it, start, it starts with us, you know, we have to have that awareness first. So the more that you are aware individually as your, to, to your own menstrual cycle and, and what you need in certain phases and how you feel and where your strengths are and your vulnerabilities, it's going to help you communicate that to someone else. So we really have to start with ourselves. And that's again where that charting comes in and that daily practice of just checking in and observing these patterns over time. So that's number one, of course, is start with you and, and start with that awareness piece. And I do like using the cycle of the day, as I just did earlier, to explain to somebody who has never had a menstrual cycle and who will never have a menstrual cycle. So I think that it does, all the seasons of the year, I think those two analogies can really help someone to understand that you know, we don't feel the same every single day, just like we do feel um, 
like our energy rising at say like 9 or 10 a.m. as we're starting work and then we feel like a, an increase and then we feel this kind of like waxing and slowing in energy, maybe feeling more tired around say like 4 o'clock, um, settling into the evening, like that energy is different and then again like moving into sleep. I feel like that 24-hour cycle does help. It has really helped my partner to understand how I change across the entire month. So to the point where he now says like, if he's in his autumn, if it's like four or five in the afternoon and he just needs to like chill and, and you know, have some time alone and just like relax up the working day, which he likes to do. And I want to chat. Um, he's like, I'm in my autumn. I just need some time alone. <laughs> I love that. That's amazing. <laughs> You know, it's important to recognize that like we're all cyclical beings, even if we don't have a menstrual cycle, we all need to have that time out sometimes. And and the same his spring in the morning, he's like, I'm in my spring, I need to get in the zone, do some work. So <laughs> love that so much. <laughs> really natural and normal. So that when I'm like, Well, I'm in my spring, so now I need, you know, I need to, um like I'm gonna get into work and I'm gonna do this, but like let's plan something fun for the weekend because I'll be in my summer. And as today, as I said, I'm day 18 today. I can feel I'm crossing over into my autumn. And so, you know, he knows that for the next week, I'm not going to be my most extroverted self. I'm probably not going to want to pack a weekend full of social stuff like we did maybe two weekends ago. This weekend, actually, I'm probably going to need some more time alone. Maybe I might need, you know, him to give me some space. Um, and that when we do that, we operate in that way we respect where each other are um it just oh, it just creates a much more intimacy and um it gives you know it strengthens relationships it really really does so the first thing is starting with yourself knowing your own strengths and vulnerabilities and what you do need to to take care of yourself and knowing if you need to ask for help that's okay particularly for mums and people who have families and responsibilities and, and commitments like we can't just click it you know our fingers and those just vanish when we are in those more vulnerable moments so you know can you ask for help from your partner at that time i when i have my period for example um i don't do the washing up all the cooking for a couple of days like alex takes care of that and then i um you know i get back in my in my ovulatory phase when i am feeling more energy you know more resilient and i'm really happy to like to cook and to clean and do more around the house and i'll give that back to him then so just again recognizing that we're not linear and they, it won't be the same all of the time but there are these little tweaks that we can make within our um, part, partnerships and family units and you know this can hopefully extend out into the work place as well and in friendship groups and um and in, hopefully one day into our our systems everywhere in our society that we do have this understanding of the menstrual cycle and that we can you know benefit from recognizing the value of, of understanding where people are at different times and working to their strengths and taking care of vulnerabilities as well yeah i love that and honestly i just think it's so beautiful how everybody can access this you know mm -hmm. picture of like the seasons and everything and the other way that I've done it is because I'm also a primary school teacher and I used to have the really mm -hmm. little kindies and I found that I couldn't tell them you know Miss Miller's on a period that that wasn't going to work so I often use the analogy of a battery like a phone battery and I'd say to them I'm like you know I'm going to be my battery's probably going to be about 10 or 20 percent for the next four days and then they kind of were like, okay, we get it. So then that they understood. And then it became almost like language in the classroom that they would just come in one day and one of them would just be like, oh, I'm 82 today, 82%. I was like, brilliant, great day. And then other days you'd get another kid come in and go, I'm about a six. And I'm like, that's okay. But it became a really nice kind of, I don't know, language to use with children. If, for example, they haven't learned the seasons, but you still want to have that nature with them like you have with your partner you use the seasons I found that that was a really nice easy way for them to pick it up if they haven't had that knowledge of seasons yet and that was just a really nice one to use through the day yes. I love that so much that's so sweet and and I think that really speaks to yeah the fact that we all have these ups and downs we all have different days but not we're not at 100% all the time and certainly from friends of mine and colleagues who are moms and who have kids and have tried to integrate you know and successfully integrating menstrual cycle awareness into the family have had those conversations with their kids as well to say like you know what mum is on like yeah 10 today so we're just going to have a relaxed day today and 
cool. Like they're happy to have, you know, relaxed time as well. I'm not saying that it works all the time, but to try to bring the whole family in on that too and be like, right, this is just going to be a chilled, relaxed day today rather than trying to force ourselves to be that like superwoman, ovulatory woman all of the time. Um, that's what leads to burnout. That's what creates more stress in the body. That's what leads to premenstrual symptoms and, and menstrual issues and burnout. But if we can just say, okay, cool. Like the whole family is going to come with me on this journey throughout my menstrual cycle to the best of our abilities from what I hear from people that really does it does often work that's amazing and it's so nice to bring everyone together so everyone has that common language understanding I love it um before we finish up I do have a couple more questions for you and one of them is about your new book I plowed through it in a day. I absolutely love it. And I honestly do believe it should be in schools. It is such a fun, easy to flick through book. It's so understandable. Can you tell us a bit about it? Of course. Thank you. That's really kind. So I wanted to create a book, Ellie, that on the menstrual cycle that didn't feel overwhelming, that didn't feel super clinical, and that was easy to understand and accessible for anyone, you know, in their menstruating years from that first period right up until perimenopause, menopause and beyond I mean I want anyone to read it but yeah the thing is that there are so many books that are that are that I love that have like been incredible resources for me in my studies and and my learning in this field but that are like you know they're big they're in depth there's a lot there's a lot there and you know for the average person who just wants to figure out how to start charting how to live more in sync with their menstrual cycle and all the things that we've been talking about today um this book I hope gives a, a fun, playful, warm, clear, concise understanding of how to start charting, how to recognize these superpowers and these vulnerabilities in the different four phases of the menstrual cycle. Yes, what's going on hormonally, but how does that affect you physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually? Like how to have these conversations with people, how to recognize when there is something going on that might actually need an expert opinion um and so it's get called 50 things you need to know about periods it's gorgeous it's a hardback book fully illustrated and um yeah i'm really proud of it i'm really excited to see it out in the world and to see to see where it lands and um yeah i'm just really honored to have been able to create to create this and have a publisher you know back me i got a lot of i got a lot of rejections from publishers who felt that it was like too niche and that it wasn't um you know, there wasn't enough need for it, which is fascinating to me because at some point, you know, 50% of the population are going to menstruate. So I'm not sure it's that niche, but um, I, yeah, I'm just excited to see it go, go out into the world now and, um, and be loved and, and hopefully to help some people recognise that, as we've said, like we're cyclical beings and expecting ourselves to maintain the same levels of energy and productivity and mood every day is just... It's just unrealistic. Amazing. And I completely agree with you. I don't think it's niche. You know, 50% of us are going to menstruate at some point and the other 50% live with us. Mm-hmm. So, mm-hmm. I just, but it is, I highly recommend the book. Like I said, went through it in a day and it is so easy to come back to. It's got beautiful illustrations. It's, it's really wonderful. So congratulations and thank you for writing it. My pleasure. My pleasure. Uh, my final question for you is, what topic do you think needs to be taught in school that isn't menstrual health and period health? What's mm. another topic that you think that needs to be in the curriculum? Money. Money. Yeah. Yeah. Finances. And and not just in a like, <laughs> I know that we did some in maths, but nothing I learned in that has actually been helpful when I've been doing my taxes or like my bookkeeping or trying to you know determine where I'm going to spend to spend my money to save my money really none of it's actually been helpful so I you know and money beliefs you know not just the like not just practicalities but looking at beliefs around money and finance understanding how the economy works and understanding how um yeah how it's so important and it's been a huge learning of mine over the last well certainly the last seven or eight years of being self-employed but um yeah i'd love to see more more information on having like healthy relationship with money and healthy finances for kids in school 
I completely agree with you, like a hundred percent. You do. You literally were like, "Oh, I've, I've added coins together. That was really helpful at tax time." Thank you, teachers. Mm-hmm. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It has just been amazing having you. And where can people find you to get more information about your programs and your book? Oh, it's been a joy. Thank you so much, Ali. Um, if anybody wants to learn more, you can come and take a course with me or one of my free classes at clairebaker.com so that's c-l-a-i-r-e b-a-k-e-r.com the book is there you can learn more about the book and find links to order you can also find the book in um in booksellers so your local bookstore will have it too and on instagram i am at underscore clairebaker underscore and that's my favorite place to hang out on social media definitely and share where I'm at in my cycle, I often have cycle check in so people can share where they are in their cycle and how they're feeling and um, and connect because it is it is important to to share with other people as we've just said like where are you today and I'm here and yeah and, and connect in that way. I love doing that with girlfriends. So yeah, come over to Instagram and tell me where you are in your cycle today. And it is very fun over on Claire's Instagram. I can vouch for that. I'm a big follower, amazing stuff on there. So once again, Claire, thank you so much for having and uh, well, coming on. And it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much, Ali. Love what you're doing with this podcast. And I'm, um, yeah, so honoured to be here.